afternoon, good evening, good whatever time of day it is. Thank you for tuning in to Conversations with Dr. Don. Uh, the show is produced and broadcast from Portland, Oregon, USA. For your first time viewers, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique, one of a kind individuals, and whatever it is that we have decided to talk about. So that we'll be talking about the evolution and revolution of the hydrocarbon industry with my new friend Jack Kerfoot, who I've been hounding for months now at the gym. When are you going to come on and talk to my viewers about mm -hmm. what your expertise is? And he's kept saying, well, give me a little more time, a little more time. So finally I cornered him, or he cornered me, and here we are. Jack, thank you for coming on. You're certainly welcome, Dr. Don. It's a yeah. pleasure. And it's interesting seeing you in regular clothes because you're usually in your gym outfit running That's around. True. And you, you never stop moving. Why is that? Well, I don't, why stop moving? Energy is good. <laughs> Human energy is good. And you're a marathoner? Uh, I've done a few marathons and triathlons, yes. Yeah, and that's why you keep so moving around so much in the that gym. That's correct, absolutely. I got to hold on to him when I say, I got to talk to you, Jack, just a minute. <laughs> it's always a pleasure to see you at the gym because you're a pleasant man that visit with you're about most anything in the world. So as you know, the first half of the show is what I call the bio segment, where we talk to Jack about who he is personally and how he got to be where he is and what he's done so far in his life. As we talk about hydrocarbon and re revolution and so on and so forth. So we're going to go through uh, the first part, and then we'll allow enough. How much time do we want, want to allow in the second half? Uh, 40, 50 minutes, 30 minutes? I think about 40 minutes should be fine to go through this presentation. And if we get talking too much in the first half, kick me under the table so we can stop, because we don't want to miss any of what you're doing. Right. <laughs> I, I would say that, just to help explain, that the, the way this presentation evolved is I was living in Malaysia, and I was asked by the Malaysian government to explain how a small American company for whom I worked could come into the country and within five years become the largest oil producer in the country. Within five uh, years? Within five years, exceeding companies like Exxon that had been in Malaysia almost 50 years and Shell that had been in Malaysia for over 100 years. Um, and so this, that's how the presentation started and then evolved into a formal presentation that I gave at a, a conference uh, in Den Haag, in the uh, Netherlands. And several members of OPEC asked to see it, and then I was then able to give the presentation to a larger group of OPEC members to explain how the industry has changed dramatically over the last 20, 30 years. And you've done a good job with that. Well, I hope so. Uh, I seem to have answered a lot of questions to a lot of people. But, of course, it's an industry that's not well understood. Most people only under think of oil companies. They think of the gas stations that they pass by, the Shells, the BPs, the Exxons, where in actual fact the industry is far more complex uh, and much larger than just those few companies. And how long have you been away from this work you're doing? Um, Actually, I'm still doing it. I'm semi-retired. Uh -huh. Semi-retired. Uh, semi-retired. I keep saying I'm going to retire, but uh, I keep getting pulled back. Um, I've been doing this almost uh, 40 years, um, working for majors and independents. In, we've lived in seven, eight different countries in the world, overseas, working in the U.S., Canada, uh, Australia, Southeast Asia, uh, and the Middle East. Uh, and I've done work in Africa and South America as well, and Europe, of course. So it's a, been a fascinating um, career. Um, all over the world, pretty much, huh? All over the world, yes. So you're going to miss it when it's all done? Uh, what are you going to do when you stop doing this? Uh, well, I'll probably be able to spend more time uh, in the gym, which I would enjoy. And you also, can't spend any more time in the gym. <laughs> <laughs> and also more involvement in my church and, of course, uh, trying to stay up with my wife, who moves faster than I do. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let me get to my cheat sheet here and ask you a few questions mm -hmm. and see where we go from there. Okay. Uh, the evolution and revolution of the hydrocarbon industry, the evolution, you talk about in your slides uh, how it's evolved and changed through the years and how what you have learned and what you presented shows that things can go better and more efficiently if you have somebody who's not tied in, locked into the existing systems. Is that true? 
Well, uh, I think what I would say is uh, if we go back into the 1950s and the 1960s and even the 70s, um, the large major companies, companies like Shell, Exxon, Mobil, Gulf Oil, Unical, Marathon, ConocoPhillips, companies that many people would be familiar with, um, really haven't changed the way they've done business. Uh, and the, the key event in the industry was, first of all, the increase in the oil and gas price um, through OPEC, and that was in the mid and late 70s. And then, effectively, that increase in price wa created um, a series of successes in different parts of the world in oversupply. And that, in turn, resulted in a dramatic drop in price because of oversupply mm -hmm. from $38, $40 a barrel down to $8 a barrel. Wow, so that's quite a drop. At that point in time, uh -huh. two things happened. Um, the majors were simply trying to understand how to survive financially. And through 1985 through 1990, probably 50% of the workforce were made redundant or laid off uh, as they were trying to understand what the new economics were of the world. And at the same time, national oil companies or companies that are owned by uh, foreign governments or governments started uh, a period of r rapid growth. And those uh, foreign oil companies or national oil companies as they're called, they had different goals but they were always funded by the government which meant that they had almost unlimited supply of capital at no cost. Mm -hmm. uh, opportunities were opened to them through diplomacy, country to country diplomacy. Uh, certain countries felt that they would have certain cultural advantages as an example, Repsol, which is the state-owned oil company of Spain, feels that they can work in South American and Latin American countries more effectively than people that are not English or Spanish as the primary language. Mm -hmm. um, and so these were a period of growth. So they were a period of optimism and growth. At the same time, you've got major contraction uh, by the majors and uh, the larger uh, independence uh, operators. Um, in Europe and the United States. And then we start to see some major changes along the way, changes where the majors are no longer the primary generators of new technology, where the majors are no longer the primary generators of production or the operators of producing fields. And then the independents, the small companies, uh, and there are literally hundreds in the United States, basically dominate exploration. And exploration means the search and finding of new oil and gas reserves in the world. Right now, about 85% of the exploration that occurs in the world are by independent companies. By independents, right? right. Rather than so the big ones. That's exactly right. So mm -hmm. the punchline of my presentation is that the major companies, BP, Shell, and Exxon, uh, have become irrelevant into the greater scheme of things. That's amazing. It, it isn't if you really stand back and look at the industry. It's not that surprising, but it is surprising to the vast majority of people because the oil and gas industry has done, I think, a very poor job of explaining who we are, what we do, what we do well, and what we don't do very well. well we're going to find out how it is you've evolved this kind of thinking okay. to see what's going on and to see the kind of uh, recognition that needs to be so that the large corporations can still continue their work. Uh, the large corporations can continue their work if they do their work appropriately, and that includes HSE, Health, Safety, and Environmental uh, Concerns. So, will you say HS what? HSE, Health, uh -huh. Safety, and Environmental. Yes. Um, and I found in my career that there are two types of companies when it comes to safety and environment, those that talk about safety and those that are really safe and environmentally prudent. And one of the saddest events that I ever saw was the BP spill. Um, actually, it makes me quite angry. In the Gulf? Because of before Macondo in the Gulf of Mexico, over a 60-year period, drilling over 200, perhaps even 300,000 oil and gas wells in the Gulf of Mexico, a total of 44 barrels of oil had been spilled in about seven or eight occurrences. Now that sounds, 44 barrels of oil, that sounds like a lot, but over the period of time it's not that much. But to put it in perspective, that's less oil and is spilled by tankers in the Gulf of Mexico every year. Mm -hmm. So the Gulf of Mexico up until the time the Macondo spill had an exemplary record. And the Mineral Management Service uh, monitors the 
operations. They're continually looking for any oil slicks, monitoring the performance uh, and safety of the rigs and the platforms. Um, a small amount of rust on a production platform the size of your finger can result in a $500 fine, obviously more serious. So uh, they're doing a serious job. Very, very serious, as does the Coast Guard. So those, both of those agencies there. But uh, Macondo was, to me, in my opinion, uh, inexcusable and uh, speaks very poorly of a company like BP. Well, let's talk about you personally for a few minutes mm -hmm. more because you've got so much stuff to say, but let's do, get through with this first part here. Uh, if I were to ask your best friend, uh, who is Jack? What would your best friend say? Jack is what? Uh, Jack is driven. I've always been driven. Uh, driven. I never know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, try to do the best job you can with the time you have and, and the capabilities that you have. That's what I would say. Yeah. I am. That is Jack. And when and where were you born? I um, was actually born in Oklahoma. I was born in the town of Shawnee, Oklahoma, but I grew up in the town of Tulsa. And Tulsa in the 60s, uh, 50s and 60s, was the old oil capital of the United States. Yeah. Uh, because that's where so much production was in Oklahoma, Kansas, uh, and northern Texas. Um, mm -hmm. So because of that, uh, it was a great place to grow up because the schools had tremendous capabilities. Um, I was able to take in high school, uh, school a course in geology. And I was able to take a, a course in computer science back in the day when a computer would fill a very, very large room and there were cathode ray tubes, which was unheard of in those days in most high schools. So um, mm -hmm. it was a wonderful place to grow up. Um, and then I spent time in the military in, in Vietnam. I was with the 101st Airborne Division and then I came back and uh, started university at the University of Oklahoma. And after that I joined, uh, took a job offer from Mobile in Denver, Colorado and they proceed to move around the world in different locations. So you managed to get through Vietnam without PTSD? Uh, well, I've been a resilient person, so uh, I, I, I was very, very fortunate, yes. Yeah. If I ask you a question that you don't want to answer, you can tell me, get lost. Uh, I don't want to talk about that. I'm not afraid to do that, Don. Uh, about any racial, national, or cultural heritage other than Oklahoma that you can tell our viewers about? Not really. I mean, uh, my I have an interesting history from a, from a family standpoint. My mother's mm -hmm. side uh, family was settled around from England in North Carolina, and uh, one of her great 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 grandfathers was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, oh. Charles Carroll of Carrollton. And of course, then they struggled through uh, repeated wars of of independence in the Civil War. Uh, my father's um, my grandfather uh, actually left Kentucky and went to Oklahoma for a land run uh, in Oklahoma. That's why they packed up and moved in mm -hmm. my covered wagon. And he uh, participated in the Cheyenne Arapaho land run, which was in northeastern Oklahoma. How did you get all this history together? You, you research or what? Uh, no, my grandfather uh, evolved the uh, genealogy of the family, and then wow. the fa my mother's family had some of that too. So I've just got a a memory for details and facts. How about a religious preference? Do you have one of those? Yes, I do. I'm Christian. Uh, uh -huh. And we're members of Portland a Christian Church in uh, Portland. How long have you been involved with, with that? Uh, Since we, uh, when I retired from the company when I was in Australia that I was with in 2011, we relocated to, or located to uh, Portland. We uh, did our research uh, on places to live and we always felt uh, Oregon was uh, a wonderful place for many reasons. People Don't say that. People have been moving in here. Well, <laughs> yes, I, I just thought you put toll gates up between California and Oregon. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we came here in 2011, yeah. and um, ultimately we ended up uh, in 2012 with the PCC, um, and we've been members since 2013. So your faith stands you in good stead in this world? My beliefs Stead, keep me in good stead, yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Helps me stay um, focused and, and strong. How about your formal education? Say so a few words about that. Um, my degrees are in geology and geophysics, primarily geophysics, uh, from the University of Oklahoma. Uh, I've also studied law at, uh, started law school at Denver University and then was transferred, so I 
couldn't finish that. And then I started law school again when I was in Oklahoma City at Oklahoma City University. And again, I was transferred, so I didn't uh, finish law school there. And I've had the opportunity to attend uh, management courses, uh, several month courses that my company sponsored at uh, Penn State uh, and also at Wharton. Uh, so I continued my education uh, through sponsorship by my companies I've been with. Is that a consideration of your seeing yourself as being driven? I think it's a consideration. Um, the, the challenge in, in many industries, particularly with scientists, is uh, you have a lot of people that are very technically skilled, uh, but the fundamental question that they, the companies have to deal with is how do you turn that technical skill into uh, to a business that can make money? Sure. And I've had an ability to uh, understand what drives profit and loss uh, and understand how to conduct operations in the way that will maximize value in a safe and uh, environmentally prudent manner. Mm -hmm. How about family? You have children? Just my wife and myself. We've yeah. been married 38 years. 38 years. Do you like your wife? Uh, she she uh, likes me. That's the most important thing. <laughs> <laughs> She's got a, a book over her face yes, now when right. I ask the question. You that's didn't know right. that was coming, did you? Right. <laughs> Thank you for coming with him. Somebody's got to keep an eye on him. That's right. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful. Uh, political persuasion. Do you see yourself left, right, center, or what, or all over the place? Uh, I, I think a, a bit of both, actually. I guess uh, my, my comment is I don't bar vote the party. Uh, I vote the issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and the issues are dynamic, as our world is dynamic. So it's important to understand what the major issues are. Um, I, I think the current president has done uh, an outstanding job. Uh, his recent uh, proposal uh, on energy, particularly reducing carbon emissions, I think is, is on the mark. Mm -hmm. I'll perhaps touch on that later. Uh, but uh, I voted both blue and red, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I have some uh, opinions that would be considered conservative and some that would be considered liberal. Mm -hmm. And you care really about human beings, no matter what class or where they're from. Absolutely. I, that shows, yeah. Uh, I'm aware of the time. Let's see if we should wind down now and prepare right. for the second part. Uh, let's see. Uh, Maybe one, one trick question, I haven't asked you one yet. Why were you born? I'm a baby boomer. Uh, so uh, my father, I have a sister, and she was born before the Second World War. And then my father went off to uh, the Second World War, and then I was born after his return um, from uh, the military after the Second World War. So I'm a baby boomer. OK, and that's, that's, that's why you were born? Uh, that and my mother and father cared, each, cared for each other very much. It shows. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mr. E, can we take a break and get into the main part of this program, which is so b doggone important? It looks like we're back, and thanks for staying tuned. And for you viewers who missed the opening of the show, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one-hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people, like most of you out there, about who they are as unique, one-of-a-kind individuals, and about whatever it is that we decided to talk about tonight. And an example of interesting people is our guest this evening, Jack Kerfoot. I'm having a, having a good time so far. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, Dr. Don. I'm, I hope you are too. Yes. So okay. shall we start with you uh, telling us what's going on in this, all this material you bought here and all your research? Okay. <laughs> Ready? Yes, of all course. Right. And you were talking about, there's a title of this presentation. presentation. That's right. Hydrocarbon Exploration and Production, the Evolution and Revolution of the Industry. 
this actual slide shows the price of oil between the 1880 all the way up to 2008 and 2007 dollars. We have to realize that in the early days of the 1800s, oil was effectively replacing uh, whale oil as a uh, source for lighting uh, for lamps. Whale oil, huh? Yes, that's mm -hmm. right. So effectively, we stopped slaughtering the whales and started drilling and finding oil. Then we had stability of price up until about the 1970s, where we see a surge with OPEC, and then we start to see the volatility after that period of time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use a few definitions here. Private sector basically means no government or financial corporation control. The uh, super major or companies like British Petroleum, ExxonMobil, Shell, majors, companies like Occidental, which you may have heard of, or the older Conoco and Phillips, and then small independents. And in the United States, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of independent operators. It's the small independent operators that has basically caused the boom in shale oil and shale gas. Shale oil. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, national oil companies, that's a government influence. Basically, that means a government controls or has a dominant controlling interest in the company. They are financially advantaged. The governments will lend them money at no interest rate and sometimes with no obligation to repay that money. They have opportunities through diplomacy, uh, creating opportunities that are not available through the private sector, and also certain cultural advantages in select regions. As I mentioned, Repsol, which is the Spanish national oil company, believe they can operate in Spanish-speaking countries like in South America more efficiently than companies that are uh, Spanish is not the primary language. Mm -hmm. All right, now we go back to the historical oil price, and we see that we've got two periods, a period of the industry evolution, 1880s all the way up to 1985, and then we go into the period of the industry revolution. <coughs> with a few animations here. We look at the period, then is subdivided into a period of private sector growth, followed by a period of national company growth. Now, what we see is in the 1880s through 1950s, a period of, in, well, particularly the 1880s, period of industrial revolution, which created the demand for oil. Then it caused a proliferation of private sector growth. The demand is there, and then you start to see companies formed. Uh, interesting footnotes, not only companies like Standard Oil, which evolved, spun off, and became Exxon, but Occidental, which was actually formed by a dentist, Dr. Armin Hammer, who was the drilling dentist. Mm -hmm. um, that's how that uh, company was formed. Then what we see is this period of time that I'm talking about, more private sector companies are formed and also more private sector com formed per five-year period of time than any other period of time in the history. 1911, we see the breakup of Standard Oil into companies like Exxon, Mobil, Standard Oil of, of California, Chevron, and then Mobil. Why were those companies broken up? They were broken up because at the time Theodore Roosevelt felt that um, Standard Oil was stifling the growth of the oil industry, mm -hmm. and he felt that there needed to be more competition. And based on what Standard Oil was doing, it was a very prudent move at that time. Yes. So now we go. In Europe, the European companies, British Petroleum, um, of course we have Royal Dutch Shell, they are exploring uh, in countries which are colonies for that particular country. Shell is actively exploring Indonesia, which was a Dutch colony at that time. Mm -hmm. British Petroleum is in the Middle East. Uh, they are in Egypt, they are in Iraq, they are in Iran. Although not colonies, effectively they are under the military domination of the British government. Mm -hmm. U.S. experiences a boom in exploration. Their experience is a boom because, one, there are numerous basins in the onshore U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, as a snapshot in time in 1950, which wasn't that long ago, the United States had the largest daily production of any country in the world, and they also had the largest proven reserves of any country in the, the world. The U.S. So they were the Saudi Arabia in 1950. And then, of course, the other reason is easy land access. The United States is unique in the fact that if someone wants to drill a well on shore, they can approach the landowner, and if the landowner agrees, and the landowner can, of course, refuse, they can drill the well, they'll give them a pay them uh, cash to drill the well, and then they'll also give them uh, what's called a royalty or a payment for all the production that comes out on a quarterly basis. Now, then we look at the period of time for the national oil company growth. 
and this coincides with the period of time that we see the national oil companies formed. First wave starts post-World War II, really. <coughs> a lot of these uh, companies are formed because the countries are rebuilding after the devastation of the Second World War. Mm -hmm. Then the second phase, we start to see many are exporting oil companies, uh, or countries are exporting oil. And in these cases, the government wanted to make sure that the, the, uh, the assets, the oil, which was 85, 90 percent of the gross domestic product in some countries, mm -hmm. was being used to the maximum value. And then finally, we see a period in time where Asia, in Japan, in China, and Korea, countries have virtually no hydrocarbon reserves, and they form their national oil companies to secure those reserves. Mm -hmm. But now we go through a period of time, the NOCs, or national oil companies, grow. Um, they recognize the energy, rebuilding after World War II, rebuilding after, uh, or building when a company, be a country becomes an independent country and uh, leaves the col a colonial rule. Oil exporting countries optimize their resources, and then the 1980s we see the boom in Asia. Now, the conclusion is what were the corporate priorities in 1985? And as you'll remember, I said in 1985, the oil had ramped up to $38, $40 a barrel, and all of a sudden had dropped to $8 a barrel. So the earnings that the companies had had dropped 75%. Well, Why did they the drop so radically? They dropped because there was an oversupply. Ah, uh, okay. So mm -hmm, it's yes. simply supply and demand. There's no... Uh, I'm afraid there's no mysterious reason of the reason of going up and down. It's simply a supply and demand. Sure. We're seeing a softening of the market today, quite simply because the success in North America in shale oil and shale gas, and also the continued production out of the Middle East, there is now an oversupply relative to the demand of energy uh, in the world. So oil goes from $110 a barrel down to $44 a barrel. Wow. So what we see is a very dramatic difference between the national oil companies that were expanding and the private sector that were simply trying to exist. And I think it's best if we say it summarizes one was able to accept risk, which is the national oil company, and one was risk averse because they could not risk capital, they couldn't afford to lose money. And one was optimistic, which was the national oil company, and the others were pessimistic. As I said, between 85 and 90, approximately half the workforce was made redundant uh, in the private sector. And the national oil companies were financed by the nations? That's correct. That's correct. And, uh, okay. All right. So the next thing we look at is the period of national oil companies start to develop their exploration and production capabilities. The majors lose their production dominance. The majors, again, are companies like Exxon, BP, Shell, Total. In 1972, the top 10 producers, 93% were by companies like Exxon. Mm -hmm. In 2006, only 22% of the production of the top 10 companies were by companies like Exxon. And what has happened is the national oil companies now dominate production. And these are the top 10 producers in 1976. The white, uh, yellow companies are private sector companies, Exxon, BP, Shell, Texaco. There are only two national oil companies, one out of Russia and one out of Algeria in the top 10. Mm -hmm. Then we look at 2006 and we can see Aramco, Saudi Arabian national oil company, followed by uh, the Russian national oil company, the Iranian national oil company, followed by the Pimax out of Mexico, are now the dominant producers. And what we see is the top three producers in 2006 are producing significantly more than Exxon was in 1972. So again, not only the production up with the national oil companies, the dominant producers are now the national oil companies. This actually shows the production of each of those private sector major or super major companies and what's happened between 72 and 2008. And the granddaddy of the drop of production was Chevron, of an 84% drop. I like your acoustic accompaniment. <laughs> <laughs> one, has, one has to have a bit of a sense of humor. Of course. The NOCs now start to accelerate their global growth. They have been focusing in the 70s, 80s in their, in their own countries, and now they want to grow and uh, expand into other areas. So let's just look at seven, and there are many more than seven national oil companies 
1995. We look at China, we look at Korea, we look at India, we look at Malaysia, we look at Petrobras in Brazil, and Italy out of ENI, and Statoil out of Norway. Again, many more national oil companies in Africa, in the Middle East, in Europe, and also in Latin America, like PDVSA, which is Venezuela. But you'll see that the national oil companies of these seven are in their own countries and one or two more, but very limited exposure outside of their home country. Mm -hmm. Ten years later, let's cut to they're everywhere. Wow. So they are, no, obviously they are succeeding. They are growing their expansion and seeking more opportunities in other parts of the world, Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, Europe, and Asia and Australia and North America. Service companies now drive new technology. Like I said earlier, in the 1950s and 60s, new technology of the way we drilled wells, the way we acquired data, the way we logged wells and got information in the subsurface was dominated by the super major and the major companies, by the Exxons, the BPs, and the Shells. However, that started to change. So to do this evaluation, I wanted to first plot the price of oil, which the green is right here through the period of time, and then to measure effective use of technology. It's not just money spent. I plotted the number of patents that the each, of, each of these companies were granted. And so I took the top four super majors, Exxon, BP, Shell, and Total, and they're around 400 to 500 patents a year. But that includes things like the petrochemical industry and also in refining. So if I take that out and just look at exploration and production, it's about 100 patents a year. Compare that to the top four service companies, which are significantly smaller in capital net worth, or market cap, Schlumberger's, Baker Hughes, Weatherford, um, Halliburton, we will see that they're generating over 850 patents a year. Why is that? Because effectively they see the patent as a way for them, that technology is something they can market and sell. I see. And so they are focusing on technology as a business. The super majors are saying, we're gonna continue to fund business uh, technology but not nearly to the degree that the service companies are. Now the service companies can say, we well, now can go out and look for multiple clients. We can look to the national oil companies and we can look to the uh, private sector. And actually what they find is their biggest buyer of new technology are the small companies, the little companies that can spend money on new technology that increase their chance of success. Independents now dominate global exploration, and when I say exploration, I mean the search for new accumulations of oil and gas. And you have some sort of an, a better idea on how to search for? Uh, well, I have, that's been my background that's uh, I mean. in oil and gas exploration. Most of it's been oil and gas exploration. This shows the price of oil, and these bar graphs, hopefully not too confusing, the numbers at the very top are the total number of exploration wells, wells looking for new reserves that are drilled in a four-year period of time. So when the oil price was at a high, we saw that the world was drilling about 60, more than 60,000 exploration wells a year. When the oil price dropped, we see drilling cut back. People don't have as much money to invest. And we see it ramp back up again. We see drilling is now back up to about 35,000 exploration wells a year, both onshore and offshore. What we find is that between 75 and 85 percent of the exploration wells a year are by small companies, independents, both in the United States, in Europe, and Australia, and Southeast Asia. So they're not American-owned. They are owned by small companies or investors in oil and gas companies as a way to get a return on their investment. Mm -hmm. So now we go to companies without a sustainable growth program, as many of your people as the people may remember, there was a period of time about 10, 15 years ago where there were quite a few mergers. And this actually characterizes the different companies that were acquired at different periods of time. The companies by BP, the companies by Shell, uh, by ExxonMobil, Exxon acquired Mobil, by the different years as we'll see at the bottom of the graph. And somehow I thought the, the music of Jaws was appropriate. <laughs> Uh, for this. It makes me nervous. Yes. Well, there's more uh, reasons to be nervous. 
Now, it's important to recognize that all the companies that were acquired wanted to be acquired. And they wanted to be acquired because they had no successful growth program. They were seeing their production decrease, their costs go up. So none of these, they were simply looking for a way to maximize shareholder value. And so they went to other companies. Emico went to BP and said, look, our costs are increasing, our production is decreasing, and we're not replacing reserves. Maybe we should merge. And the same thing happened with Mobile, Unical. However, there are other companies that are out there that are much larger. These are the national oil companies out of China, out of Japan, out of Russia, out of Europe. And you may actually recall that initially when Unical, before Unical was purchased by Chevron, Chinese made a significantly larger offer to buy Unical that was blocked by the United States government. Hmm. And as a result of that, Chevron was able to come in and secure, acquire uh, Unical, um, even though the Chinese National Oil Company had offered significantly more. I will say that CNOC made, uh, the Chinese made a similar, did make an acquisition in Canada. Um, and I think that Canadian government, which did not block it at the time, is having second thoughts uh, about that acquisition. Now, the next thing we have to realize, I wanted to compare, I've talked about super major companies, so I wanted to compare China's national oil company, CNOC, to ExxonMobil. ExxonMobil is the largest publicly traded or private sector company in the world. CNOC is effectively in many ways, not the largest producer, but one of the largest companies in many other ways. So let's take a look at his comparison between ExxonMobil and CNOC. The number of expiration wells, we see CNOC is drilling significantly more expiration wells, almost 500%. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at the number of employees. 82,000 employees for ExxonMobil, 1.6 million for CNOC. 1.6 million. Mm. And these are not uneducated people. These are highly educated people, many of which have gotten their master's and PhDs at major universities in Europe and the United States. Market capitalization at the time I did this was about $500 billion for Exxon. It was over $7 trillion for CNOC. So what we really see is the national oil companies now are the new super majors. Majors now are losing their operating efficiencies because they're not doing the same things that they did at the same level. I wanted to compare two offshore developments that occurred. They were in the deep water of Malaysia, about 4,000 feet of water. Um, two companies, one was a small U.S. independent and the other was a large European company. The fields are only 10 kilometers apart. Mm. And what we see and we look at the, the cycle time, five years versus 12 years, the cost, the number of people, more efficiency, lower cost, and I will say that the small American company actually has a better safety and environmental record than the large European company. So what I would actually say is the sun is setting on the major or super major companies like the BPs and the Shells and the Exxons. They are seeing declining production, no sustainable growth program, increasing cost structures, and increased competition from the national oil companies and also from the independents. So what I would say is the national oil companies now are really dominating global production. And we see now the service companies are the source for new technology in the industry. And again, when I talk about new technology, we have to realize the oil and gas industry has always been a very technology-intensive industry. As an example, the computer systems that most oil and companies have dwarf that of NASA. So we could put a man on Pluto as far as computer capacity. We don't have the technical skill to do that, mm -hmm. but the computer capacity far exceeds that of what NASA has. So in final conclusion, too, what we end up with is exploration. The new reserves are by the independents. So you may see the Exxon Mobil gas station, but okay. the real entities of the world or, or players in the world are now the national oil companies, the independents, and the service companies like Schlumberger, Baker Hughes, Halliburton, and Weatherford. And that's my presentation. And they won't let you go. 
Uh, well, I keep getting called back. By, I'm currently working for a company uh, at, that has operations in the Middle East, and uh, they keep wanting me to come back and see if I can help them. I bet that feels good, huh? Um, it feels good if I can see that they have success. Uh, I don't want to lead them down the path of, of uh, failure, but um, yes, it does feel good if I can help them have success. What's the likelihood that you can help them have better success? Uh, I your think ideas, your, your thinking. Uh, I, think, I think there is probably a 75, 80% chance that I can steer them in the right direction to improve their chance of having commercial success. Uh, I can't control the oil price, yeah. um, but um, I think they have a opportunity that's uh, quite unique and I think they'll do quite well. Uh -huh. I had a couple of questions that I came up with on my own and I want to ask you, and one of my questions you found that it should be rephrased, but let's go with that, all right? right. The first one was, uh, what will replace hydrocarbons as our primary source of energy in the future? What will replace hydrocarbons? Well, I, I think perhaps that my title um, shifted the focus around of what it really should be, and I would start off and say that I think Global warming is a reality, and it's a reality that must be addressed immediately, not five years from now, not 10 years from now, but immediately. Yes. Um, unfortunately, there's not a silver bullet uh, solution that we can just snap our fingers and say we're going to convert to coal fusion, and all of a sudden, within two or three years, we can eliminate uh, fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. uh, and fossil fuels, by that I mean coal, oil, and natural gas. Um, the rephrasing of the question, I would say, how do we reduce the use of fossil fuels in the United States uh, as quickly as possible? Um, the first thing I would say is coal uh, has the highest carbon emission of any of our fossil fuels. And the United States gets approximately 30% of our fuel uh, from coal power plants. So you may drive an electric car but if your electric car is plugged into a power source that is a coal-powered coal -powered power plant, mm -hmm. your carbon footprint will be worse than an autom gas uh, automobile engine. Uh, uh -huh. So the first step, I think, is to convert or shift away from coal-powered powered plants. Um, and the quickest and easiest solution and the lowest carbon footprint would be to natural gas. And that's a transitional step. That's a transitional step that could be accomplished, I think, relatively quickly in most of the three to five years, and I think we could be 80 to 90 percent complete in the major power plants. Do you think we'll go in that direction? That is what uh, President Obama has proposed, and I think it is a very wise proposal. Um, we have an abundance of natural gas. Uh, natural gas has a significantly lower carbon footprint than coal and even lower than natural gas. So I think that makes uh, a lot of sense uh, and is the right thing. And I think if we don't take action to start reducing our carbon footprint, uh, the devastation of climate uh, uh, global warming will get only worse and we'll pay for the consequences both in human life and also financially. And there are some people who are saying some, I, I call them probably, uh, and I'm a lefty, environmental extremist sort of, and like, let's leave those kinds of materials in the ground. What do you say to those people? Well, then I would say the first thing I want to do is to cut the uh, environmental footprint as quickly as possible. Now, you could, we could all go out and uh, live in the woods without electricity and without lights and without heating. Um, but we're also left with another problem, which is also associated with global warming, and that is in 1950, uh, there were about, there were less than one billion people in the world. Today, there's almost nine billion people. So nine billion people left out in the woods, we're all going to start chopping down trees to, uh, as fuel to keep ourselves warm, and we're also going to uh, find that we're still going to have um, a carbon footprint that's most significant. So the Global warming issues that we have are more complex, more than just fossil fuels. Uh, but we can address the fossil fuels, and so we need to then make the next step. My would say, I would say the next step then is to start investing uh, for the government to provide more tax breaks, 
uh, and tax in, uh, tax incentives, and also investment in research dollars in alternative uh, energy such as solar, wind, um, hydro, uh, and also tidal energy as well. Um, we're seeing that already. There's been massive investments in wind energy, particularly in the south and the southwest. Um, a, a good friend of mine, Boone Pickens, um, has been in, involved in that. As they've built these power plants, wind farms, uh, what they found is new sets of problems. Um, some of those problems include um, once they have a prolific amount of energy built up, <coughs> then the question if they have an oversupply of energy, how do they uh, de-bottleneck the power grid that they have to other uh, news uh, energy so or buyers that would take that energy? Um, also, of course, wind, as we should understand, also is a primary influence in the migratory path of birds. And it's very important you understand where you put those wind farms or otherwise you can devastate entire populations of birds as well. <coughs> we also have to recognize that areas like the Pacific Northwest doesn't have the abundant sunshine of the southern states. At the same time, the Pacific Northwest has significant hydro uh, potential that I feel should be expanded as well. So recognize your region and invest in that region. And you will also need dupl duplicate energy sources because there are always going to be periods of time where the wind doesn't blow, when it's cloudy, and the sun doesn't shine. So you have to have alternative energy as backup to your primary source. And then finally, the longer term solution is <coughs> either coal fusion or alternative energy, um, which has no carbon footprint at all. And what would that be? Well, we can hope for fusion, <laughs> or we have to accept the risk with nuclear. Nuclear, and how do you feel about that? Uh, now we're getting controversial. Um, I think what we've seen is in Fuku Fukushima, um, even with a very modern power plant, mm -hmm. uh, that with natural disasters, earthquakes, uh, and tsunamis, um, even the best nuclear power plant design and preparation can lead to catastrophe. And Germany's moving to very deliberately against nuclear power. As are many people in Japan, as are many people in North America as well. So I see nuclear as, uh, I have severe reservations about uh, nuclear power. And we're running out of time, but I'm gonna ask you another question, sure. shall I? Sure. Uh, will the use of hydrocarbons worldwide diminish to a point where there will no longer be a major contributor to global warming climate change. Now, what comes to mind there is some people now running for the presidency of our country who are saying there's no such thing as climate change, and there are others who are saying for sure there's climate change, and where do you come down on that argument? Well, I, I think the people that say there is no such thing as climate change are probably the same number of people that believe the Earth is still flat. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so yes, I do believe that we are seeing a climate change as well. We have to realize of uh, oil and gas that's generated, about 40% of it is generated uh, used for gasoline, diesel about 25%, jet yeah. fuel about 10%. Other products though are used for hydrocarbons, everything from uh, tires, uh, eyeglasses, cortisone, um, cough syrups, uh, ballpoint pens and telephones. So there's a broader market there. You can say, all right, I'm going to eliminate gasoline, I'm going to eliminate diesel and jet fuel, uh, <coughs> and I'm down to 10%. But the other problem that we have is an increasing population. And even though what we've seen in the past 20 years is the increase of about 1% per year in consumption in oil in the world, and an increase of 10% per year in natural gas in the world. And that's because we've seen a dramatic increase in population. So again, climate change is not just the use of hydrocarbons for fossil fuels. It also means how we live, how we build our, archi our architectural design, and also our global populations as well. Wow. So this population increase, what are we going to do about that? Well, <clears throat> uh, that's an interesting question, and I'll leave that to the people that are running for president of the United States. <laughs> Son of a <laughs> gun, you never miss a beat. <laughs> yeah, interesting, interesting uh, presentation, what you've talked about, but there's more, I'm sure, that we don't have time to go into, but there's a few minutes left for us to have you tell the viewers any further thoughts that you didn't cover in your presentation or as a result of our 
talking here. Uh, what, what, what else would the viewers be curious about your, your opinion about what you've presented so far? Well, I, I think it's important to recognize that, um, that there is that no issue that, you, that we have today that we're faced with is a simple uh, sound bite that's presented on the news television today. It's usually far more complicated than that. Um, energy policies are, must take into effect many, many factors, both environmental, mm -hmm. uh, population, the supply, the demand, the macroeconomic situation of the regions as well. So the thing I would suggest and recommend is that we realize that the 10-minute sound bites or 10-second sound bites we have on very complex situations, uh, there's far more to it than that. So learn, understand the questions, understand the, the issues at hand, recognize different opinions. The diversity of opinion is absolutely essential to find the best solution. So my, my comment would be the oil industry is not the enemy. Um, I personally would not have supported uh, Shell being allowed to drill in the Arctic region for many reasons. Uh, one, it's a very environmentally sensitive area, and two, the company does not have the safety record that I believe, personally believe would allow them to drill up there without putting significant risk to the environment. Well, seeing as how you're so sharp about so many things, I would imagine that you can project who's going to win the next presidential election. Uh, right now, uh, let's, let's, uh, I, I can't project that because I want to really hear the debate of the questions. Right now, we're having a beauty contest with the Republicans. We'll see what happens on the Democratic side. We are hearing some interesting questions being debated, and, and I think that's admirable. I think it's also admirable that we have debates on different topics, um, yeah. even if some of the people have no substance whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting you close to the borderline. <laughs> what do you think about this this uh, this phenomenon of uh, Bernie Sanders? Uh, I think Mr. Sanders has some very interesting ideas, uh, and I look forward to hearing his ideas uh, and the debate of some of the ideas that he has. Uh, and I welcome any logical and thoughtful opinion. And I believe that he's put forward some ideas that are very well thought through. Um, I may not agree on all of his policies or platforms, but I think he's got some very good ideas. And I think his inclusion in the debate, the presidential debate and the question, is very important. Wow. Middle East, Netanyahu, Israel, and the Palestinian situation. What's, what's your feelings about what's going on there nowadays? Well, if you, if you look at Iran, you have to realize that <clears throat> before the current, uh, the Ayatollah, um, there was the Shah, and before the Shah, there was actually a government. And um, the government at that time, before the Shah, nationalized the oil companies, and it is Mossadegh, huh? and it is reported uh, that the U.S. Uh, clandestine organizations um, backed the Shah or enabled the Shah to take control of the country. Um, we have to realize that Iran for many, many decades was a very strong ally of the United States. Yes. And what we have is, my question is, which will bring a better solution to peace? Conflict and potential war or negotiation as has been conducted uh, by the Europe and the North American uh, power? Reading some of the pipe, uh, articles out of the New Yorker, I think, uh, Kerry has done a phenomenal job in the negotiations. <clears throat> we also have to recognize that there's a lot of pressure back in Iran. Uh, I know uh, several good friends who are Iranian that would say that the, the religious uh, group that is in political control of the country is under a lot of pressure because of the sanctions, but also from the people themselves. And so you could be in Tehran today and you would be welcomed by overwhelming majority of the individual citizens in Tehran. Um, but again, these are very proud people. Um, these are people that have always had a long-standing history of technology. Um, we have countries such as Pakistan, uh, India, which has uh, nuclear capabilities and nuclear reactors. Scary. Um, so these are very interesting questions that uh, need to be looked at in an ongoing situation. But I think the initial solution that the Western uh, countries and Iran resolved that, I think, was uh, very positive, and I think it's something I would support. 
Well, since we had a little difficulty, we're going to be editing a few things out so we could take a minute or so more. And I've gotten away with asking you some provocative questions, so I've got one more. Okay. Yeah, the doomsday mm -hmm. clock is going back and forth as the years go by. And there's been some speculation that in the last six months or a year or so, the doomsday clock has moved closer uh, to midnight. Where do you stand right now on where the doomsday clock is? You know what I'm talking about with the doomsday clock. Yes, I'm, I'm familiar with the say, doomsday clock. Say to the viewers what that means. Uh, the doomsday clock is the uh, prognosticators would say when global uh, annihilation or global catastrophe from nuclear war would, ha would happen. Um, John, I'm, I'm a Christian. I trust in God. So my solution, my answer to your question is, I don't know about the doomsday clock. We could all make a, a guess, and it would be a guess. That of and course. $5 will get me a cup of coffee. Uh, <laughs> so my comment is, uh, I, I trust in God. I don't trust in the prognosticators about the doomsday clock. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for very good. Out. Thank you. Yeah. I've enjoyed you very much. Um, <laughs> hope I hope it was uh, the viewers do as well. A few PSA, Mr. E, allowing for us some extra time, if you will. The ACLU, the American Civil Liberties mm -hmm. Union, go to the ACLU and learn how we can protect our civil liberties. It seems lately they've been under some sort of threat. So, the American Civil Liberties Union needs to be uh, embraced. To end corporate personhood, we need to reverse uh, Citizens United with a constitutional amendment that says uh, corporations are not persons and money is not speech. Next, thanks for watching. Remember KFC. Please remember KFC. Not Kentucky Fried Chicken, Dr. Don's KFC. Kind, friendly, and charitable to you too. And you too, and you too, <laughs> and you too. <laughs> Thanks again for watching. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. So we'll see you some more uh, next time. Goodbye.